So I'll just briefly touch on the Sheffield experience of ankle arthroplasty, if I may. So over a five-year period, um, I did mobility ankle replacements in 84 uh, consecutive cases in 79 patients. And uh, as is usual in the series, it's about two-thirds male and one-third female. And my mean age is exactly the same as everybody else's, which is in the mid-60s. And I, this is a complete cohort of every single case that I've operated on, and I've lost none of them to follow up. And they're both done in the NHS and privately, though the majority in the NHS. And the underlying diagnosis, as you can see, is uh, osteoarthritis. And idiopathic means, to me, probably post-traumatic. So the vast majority of these are uh, OA. I've got an unusual cohort of haemophiliac patients that I've done ankle replacements on, which uh, is definitely because we've got a very large haemophilia unit in Sheffield, and um, that, that's why that happens. And as you can see, there's a spectrum of deformities that I have taken on board. And it's only those three middle bars that I think anyone should really take on board. My various cases between 10 and 20 degrees, of which there were 26, was when I was probably more enthusiastic and thought I was better than I am. Um, and then perhaps some of them more recently is because, again, I think I'm better than I probably am. And there's interoperative complications that we all get which are relatively predictable with malleolar fractures. Um, I had a little posterior medial uh, fracture which I grafted and covered with the implant. And in one case, I miscut the talus and had to uh, rejig it and then cut it by hand. And you can see my follow-up. And the interesting part on in this slide is that those red group, the red bars, are revisions. Those are patients who have failed. And if you look at the follow-up going to your right, you can see that actually those who have done uh, well in the long term have done well without failure. Uh, and the failures, you can see, are relatively an early group. And that is a personal uh, error on my part, because I think that reflects my over-exuberant uh, putting in of ankle replacements in cases that I would now not put an ankle replacement in. So some of the cases I'm going to show you, I would regard now as historic. But I think it's important to show you, because I think that when you do start doing ankle replacements, you will rapidly become enthusiastic, because it's a great fun operation. It's a whole lot more fun than an arthroscopic arthrodesis, Harry. Um, but, but nonetheless, it, 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 it learned from my experience. Patients do pretty well in terms of their pain relief. So you can see that although it doesn't get rid of all of their pain, their mean pain score is 2.7. And if you look at those who have got a pain score of less than 4, it's the vast majority. So that's a pain score out of 10. Trish mentioned about the idea of uh, post-traumatic arthritis in adjacent joints. And one of the arguments for doing ankle replacement is that you can protect the patient against getting progressive arthritis in their adjacent joints. So there are our adjacent joint arthritis pre-op, and there's our adjacent joint arthritis post-op. So that's at five or six years. And you can see we haven't saved them from progressive adjacent joint arthritis in a relatively small series of 80 patients. This is one of the concerns that I have about specifically the mobility ankle replacement um, is this area of lucency uh, that occurs around the medial lateral anterior and posterior parts of the tibia where it's a stemmed prosthesis. And I've been back to the originators of this. There were three guys who designed the mobility, one in the UK, one in Switzerland, and one in the US. And I've visited all of them. And uh, in all of them, I've discussed this with them. And they all patted me on the back and said, don't you worry about it, Chris. It's OK. I don't think it is. Patient satisfaction, well, the patients think it's pretty good, but that's because I'm a nice guy and they like me, I think, rather than actually uh, probably these ankles being fantastic. If you look at a, a Kaplan-Meier survivor curve, uh, you have to be a little bit careful on the right there outside 60 months because the uh, confidence interval is wide. But you can see that it, it's a pretty predictable and pretty classic survival curve uh, for any joint replacement, but the curve drops much more rapidly than it will with a hip or a knee, and we are not as good as hips and knees. So I thought it might be useful just to uh, turn into Clint Eastwood for a minute and, and look at three different kinds of cases, perhaps a good, a bad, and an ugly. So here's a good. So this is a lady who is, has got um, uh, idiopathic uh, primary osteoarthritis of both her ankles. Um, she's in her early 60s. She's a moderately high demand lady. She likes riding a bicycle. She likes hill walking, but not hiking. She doesn't carry a backpack. She doesn't work in a heavy industrial setting. Um, she, she, was, she is a great case for an ankle replacement because she's truly concentric and she's bilateral. And I have a bit of a, a difficulty with bilateral ankle fusions in a very hilly place. I live in Sheffield. It's just there is no flat part of Sheffield. It's just hills all over the place. You fuse both ankles. Patients do struggle up and down hills. So we talked about doing an ankle replacement on her, and I did, and subsequently did her other. Um, these are her x-rays at eight years. She uh, is delighted. She brings me a bottle of wine at every follow-up. She's a great success. Her lateral views were good, 
but just look at that lateral on the left. I didn't put that talus there. That talus on the left looked like the talus on the right. That talus on the left is sunk, has sunk into her talus. That component has sunk and migrated. We've measured her and she truly has migrated. She's completely asymptomatic. I don't know what to do about that. At the moment, nothing. Okay, the bad. So this is one of my over-exuberant early cases. Uh, this lady is 63. She's delightful. She's got a 29 degree varus deformity. I was pretty cocky, pretty confident, thought I could fix this with an ankle replacement, with a deep deltoid release, a tib post release. And I got her into a nice position initially, but she developed progressive varus deformity. That um, tailor component and that tibial component should be parallel with each other. You can see the way the talus is drifting uh, inward. And that mobile bearing, which should be sitting straight front to back, those two little markers uh, on a true AP view should line right up to each other. And that mobile bearing is rotated slightly in there. And this is drifting into varus. And as they drift into varus, they tend to rotate externally. And she continued to progress into varus, and uh, she subsequently had a triple arthrodesis by me to try and correct the varus deformity. Uh, that, that was a bad decision, actually, and she continued to progress into varus, and she ended up with a medial malleolar fracture that you can see, and a classic tension fracture on her fibula. So the forces here are massive. If you now look at the position of that mobile bearing, it's impinging in the fibula, and you can see a little shark bite out of the fibula there, which is the mobile bearing eroding itself and eroding the fibula. And left alone, this would create massive degrees of polydebris uh, and lysis. So she had a fusion with an intramedullary nail. Her microscopy, uh, I biopsy all of these. All failures should be biopsied, and uh, that was negative. And she united by 12 weeks, and actually she is a pretty happy patient despite her long road to get to an ankle arthrodesis. What about the ugly? So this is a guy who's got type A hemophilia. Um, he's relatively young because he's got multiple joint diseases. He's had a, an arthrodesed knee and an arthroplasty knee. Uh, he's had both of his elbows replaced, which is a typical pattern of haemophilia affecting the elbows, ankles, and knees. He had concentric arthritis, and I did a standard ankle replacement on him, which went very well for about three years. And then he pitched up as an emergency in my clinic, having twisted his ankle one day, and said, I don't know what's gone wrong. I've sprained my ankle. It's really swollen and really sore. And if you look where that red arrow is pointing, that talus has migrated right into the, uh, the, into the body of the talus itself. In fact, I think his talus has fractured. He had a very tricky and, and stormy course because, in fact, he had avascular necrosis of his talus, and that talar component eventually ended up in his oscalsis. And uh, I biopsied him because I was very worried that he was infected. His biopsy came back just showing a disintegrated avascular talus, and I ended up doing an arthrodesis with a locking plate. Uh, I wanted him to unite, so I put lots of graft in, including his fibula, his iliac crest, uh, and uh, OP1, which is a bone morphogenic protein. Um, so I did everything I could to get him to unite. This man uh, had a very expensive operative procedure because of his haemophilia. His tibial component, interestingly, was completely integrated and stable. I knocked it out. Unfortunately, the plate broke at uh, five years, so that was about a year after I put it in, and subsequently had an, uh, an arthrodesis of the nilazaral frame, some more uh, uh, bone graft from his other side of his pelvis, and some more 3,000-pound bone morphogenic protein, and he's left with a persistent discharging wound with mixed growth of organisms that weren't there until his frame went on, interestingly. Um, and although he's united clinically and radiographically, he lives with a sinus. He's not happy. Here's another ugly one, really. 60-year-old male uh, with idiopathic OA, 15-degree uh, deformity. I don't think that's particularly outrageous, though I would still be a little nervous of doing that deformity these days. Um, he was interesting because he complained of anterolateral ankle pain and developed a significant anterolateral cyst, which you can see with the, that red arrow there. And that's, I think, because his uh, components weren't quite uh, aligned and the meniscal bearing uh, impinged on the fibula and caused osteolysis. When I took his bearing out, he had a big shark bite out of the side of his mobile bearing. Uh, he was fortunate because I could actually graft that cyst uh, and revise that tibial component uh, and put a star uh, ankle in over the top of a mobility and created a hybrid. Um, and he's actually a very happy guy. He's a, a lightweight building manager, um, and he's done very well. So just briefly what we've learned, what I've learned, um, don't please operate on big deformities. It, it, won't, it just won't work. And you may well go, as I have, to American surgeons and gung-ho, you know, highly impressive guys who tell you that they can do 30 and 40 degrees. Well, maybe they can. I can't. And I'm not entirely sure that they can either, if I'm honest with you. So don't operate on big deformities. 
Um, don't operate if there's a history of skin disorder, uh, if there's an ulcer ever, or in, certainly within the preceding few years, even if it's healed. One of my patients has an amputation, um, and she had an amputation because she had a pre-existing uh, venous ulcer, which had been healed for three years. Um, but she broke down about a year post-op with another ulcer. Subsequently, it became infected. Subsequently, so did her ankle, uh, and she ended up with an amputation. So don't operate if they've got skin disease. And watch out for these lucent lines. Uh, I don't think we know what they are or why they're happening. I think it's probably because it's a stem-bearing implant, and so the plate is not loaded, and they resorb bone from underneath it. That's what I think is happening, but I don't know, and nobody's really published this yet. You can salvage an ankle replacement if it fails, but if you lose bone stock, you can't just do an ankle arthrodesis. You end up having to do a hind foot arthrodesis of the subtalar joint. So putting an ankle replacement in does burn a bridge sometimes, because initially that patient could have just had an ankle arthrodesis and we'd have left their subtalar joint, whereas that patient at the top there now has an intramedullary nail in um, and they've lost further motion because their ankle replacement failed. Okay, that's all I need to say. That's all I'd like to say. I'm, we're going to run a video. Um, which is a, an ankle replacement being done in a cadaver. Um, it's not me operating, but I'll talk you through it. Um, if, I don't know if there are any questions before we run to a video about ankle replacements in the round and in general terms. Perfect. Okay. So, gents, can you help me run my video, please? Is that just going to, yeah. So here we go. Here's the exposure, uh, which is a, a, a midline anterior approach. Um, this is in a cadaver. So th this looks like an easy ankle replacement because there's no deformity, there's no restriction of joint motion, um, and there's no osteophytes. They mark out the uh, nerves with a marker pen so that they can be seen throughout the procedure, and the incision is just lateral to the uh, tibialis anterior tendon, which means that EHL, which you can see there exposed under that retractor uh, on the right of your screen, is protecting the neurovascular bundle. So deep dissection down through the periosteum, capsules released, and an extensive exposure. Don't try and do an ankle placement through a small hole. They put a peculiar uh, little retractor in there, but that retractor's got to be deep. Don't retract on your skin edges because this skin is unforgiving. It's exactly like that skin at the back of the ankle. It's, it doesn't do well. So they initially take off an anterior osteophyte by two little dorsal um, uh, reciprocating saw cuts and then an osteotome to take off the anterior osteophyte so that you can gauge exactly the level at which the ankle joint replacement, it's, uh, sorry, the ankle joint, the native ankle joint is because you've got to position this uh, ankle joint not too proximal and not too distal. In this case, they're knocking off cartilage. You won't have to do that, of course, because there probably won't be much cartilage. There's an extra medullary alignment jig, um, which allows you to make sure that in the coronal and sagittal planes that, that, that the alignment is down the uh, mid-axis of the tibia. The distal jig is positioned so it's halfway out, so it's not all the way out or all the way in, because you might subsequently need to move that up or move that down, depending on what your x-rays show down the track. That jig is then positioned with uh, positioning wires, and the distal part of that jig is positioned five millimeters above the tip, top of the plafond. So that that's the position at which your implant is going to go. Careful retraction so you can see what you're doing. Make sure that the top end is positioned a finger breadth or two off the crest of the tibia, because that gives you good alignment. And subsequently, they're going to check that radiographically. Now, I don't, I don't do that because I operate in a Charmley exclusion tent, a very old traditional tent with big plastic sides, and I can't get an X-ray machine in that, so I don't X-ray them, but I think it's probably a very safe thing to do. So they're putting that on to just check the rotation alignment. You don't want to put this ankle in externally or internally rotated. And then there's this uh, lateral fin which goes on, which shows you the overall alignment in a sagittal plane. And so fluoroscopy is used to make sure that that is down the... looks like they're doing it in an office. Uh, that fluoroscopy is used to make sure that they're down the line of the tibia. They've reduced that down the height down a little bit to make sure that they truly are uh, intramedullary in terms of their alignment. I'm just demonstrating that there, and it's all locked off. It's very much like an upside-down knee jig, really. So there you go, bar down the middle of the tibia. 
and they then check the AP view, because again, the bar should be running straight up and down the tibia, particularly if you've had an old tibial fracture proximally. This is very important to make sure this is well aligned. You've got to have your ankle joint perpendicular to your knee joint. The foot's got to be flat to the floor, as has been said before. So the AP view, that's acceptable. And again, the intramedullary alignment jig is up and down the fairway, up at the top end and at the bottom. So that's then locked in, so all screws are tightened. But the distal part can now move either up and down or side to side. But you've now locked rotation and you've locked the overall um, sagittal plane, sorry, coronal plane alignment. So they're just checking here that that cut is five millimeters above the top of the plafond. Just checking the medial and lateral alignment because that fin that you can see coming down on the uh, left of the screen there, um, that should follow the talus straight up so that you're not going to knock off any medial malleolus. It's very important that the medial malleolus is protected throughout the procedure. It's vulnerable otherwise. They put a thing that they call laughingly the angel wing, wing angel of death, but um, that goes in on the view here to make sure that the cut is at the correct distal part. So they're taking off five millimeters of tibial plafond. That's then held in place with wires that go through each of those that's gonna protect the medial malleolus from inadvertent injury and another one there to protect the fibula, which they haven't exposed, but I would expose. Um, and they then put some oblique, oblique pins in the top end, so everything's locked in place before you put your whopping great big reciprocating saw in. This is quite an aggressive saw. Has to be, you're about to cut the end of the tibia off. And it's a captive saw cut. And then a reciprocating saw up off the top of the talus to complete that cut medially. You don't need to complete the cut laterally because you're gonna take the lateral aspects of the plafond out as far as the articulation with the fibula. This is difficult surgery because you can't see what you're doing. So then that cutting jig is removed and the distal part of the tibial plafond is taken out, often uh, with, with a, a little additional use of the saw there, care taken not to inv inadvertently injure the medial malleolus. Again, on the same on the lateral side, care taken you don't chop off the back of the fibula, which is of course deep and posterior there. And then use osteotomes to take this out, usually piecemeal. It's a, the most boring part of the operation because the back of it is well attached to the posterior capsule and to the posterior inferior tibiofibular ligament on the lateral side. So you've got to take care to take all of this out. Don't leave any of this behind. You've got to be looking right at the back of the capsule there and nothing else. So then the tailor cut is then built off the tibial cut. So you then put in a tibial, a tailor cutting jig which cuts the top of the talus off perpendicular to your tibial cut. That obviously means you've got to have the foot in the right position to make your initial tailor resection. This is a, a very important cut. If this is wrong and the talus is too dorsiflexed or too plantar flexed, the whole ankle joint will end up too dorsiflexed and plantar flexed. So check the position, make sure that foot's at 90, and then that tailor, locking, tailor cutting jig is then locked in place with two wires. So you've now got a stable platform for making your initial resection. They then use the angel wing of death again to just um, check that they're taking off the correct amount of talus. And in fact, I don't think they are here, and I don't think they're taking enough off. I would take more than this is about to show you on this image intensifier, and I think they're going to overstuff the joint if it was really arthritic. But we'll see. So you can see they're taking off the whisker of a gnat. Not much. So I would take off more than that. I'd take off three millimeters. They want to protect those malleoli again. So always look after the malleoli before you put an oscillating saw in, either by direct vision or with pins. Initial transverse uh, cut on the top of the talus, and then you can take off that first jig. So that's giving you a flat surface, which is perpendicular to the distal tibial cut. The rest of the ankle replacement osteotomies and removal of parts of the talus are entirely built off that flat cut. That's why that flat cut's got to be perfect. So the star ankle replacement, which is what this is, is unusual in that one of the next parts that happens is that a datum point is put in. This is a fixed reference point from which all the rest of the jigs are built. And it's why I use the star, because I think it's a very, very nice approach. They haven't done that cut quite right, so they're having to file off a bit of extra bone. That's because they didn't take enough off. And the, the distal tibial jig can now be removed, though I tend to leave one pin in, as they have, in case you have to put it back on subsequently. They put a big spatula in, which is 11 millimeters in width, and again, a fluoroscopic image they take here to check that the, um, that the joint is appropriately, uh, and enough bone, basically, has been taken off. If you can't get that in, then you're not going to get an ankle replacement in. So that's the principle, because that's the size of your tibial part and a poly bearing and the tailor part. 
So they do fluoroscopy. I'm not quite sure why they've done that, but it proves the point. They then size the talus, and they do this by making a line across the front of the talus here, which is referenced off the front of the tibia with the ankle in neutral. So in other words, they don't show that, but if you make that ankle at neutral and drew a straight line off the front of the tibia onto the talus, that's your reference point. And this is a sizing guide, which just makes sure you've got enough talus on the two sides to resect to give you a stable implant. And this is the vital part in the star. This is a small piece of metal which is screwed into place and from which all the other jigs lock onto it. I know it's used now in knee replacements as well. I think actually this predated them. Um, but it's a very clever idea and I, I like it very much. So that's a sort of little distractor that allows you to put the datum point in in a perfect position with your reference lines. And again, you can, the modern system actually has got a little... Uh, spatula that sits on this it allows you to make sure that your ankle joint is running down the interval between the second and third metatarsals. That datum point is then fixed in place with two self-drilling, self-threaded screws. They're drilled in and then finished off by hand so that they don't thread out. Powered in and then finished off by hand. And that datum point now stays in whilst the rest of the jigs are built off that. So all the introductions are taken off leaving you with a datum point in an appropriate place in the talus. And this is a useful part where they radiograph that to make sure that datum point is in the right place, which it is. And the rest of the jigs now are a sequence of jigs that essentially turns the top of the talus into half of a hexagon. So they take off the front, and they've taken off the top, and then they take off the back. So they're just doing a little bit of uh, joint preparation in the tibia there where they've left a little bit of bone. That was the bit that I said that I would have taken out at the beginning and they left it in and then took it out. This is a, a jig which allows you to cut the front and the back. So this, you can see, it fits over the datum point and it screws into place. So that datum point's got to be really well fixed. There's a supplementary hole that that man's holding with his finger there that you can put an additional wire in if this datum point is tending to toggle. They fix it then with some wires on the side as well. So again, it's a well-fixed um, jig. You don't want this thing rocking around whilst you're powering a saw. So the initial cut, I think, is at the uh, front. I do the back front, but it doesn't matter. So this is a router, and you can see it's a captive route. So this thing cuts at the end and then cuts to the side. So they fenestrate it multiply and then run that router that's uh, abridged because it actually is quite a long procedure of running that uh, backward and forward. And now they use the captive cut at the back to cut off the posterior part of the talus so that you've converted that front part into a chamfer and the back into a chamfer, not a chamfer as they say. Wires are taken out, cutting jigs removed from the datum point. The datum point itself is removed at this, no it isn't, datum point stays in now. And they just finish off the front. So you can see where they've routed the front. There's a lot of bone debris. You need to get that out, wash it out. That's osteogenic material, and you don't want heterotopic ossification around your ankle replacement. So they burr it off a little bit just to finish that off. And this is now the medial and lateral cutting guide. So this is, again, captive saw cuts to cut off the two sides, the medial side and the lateral side of the talus, because the star ankle replacement covers the talus like a hat. So it's, it's slightly different on the medial side and the lateral side because the star ankle replacement has a longer lateral side than it does a medial side because the lateral side articulates with the fibula. So you can see the saw is put in an angle at the back and then the hand is brought up to cut the back and then drawn out. That's upside down now, so the foot's on the right. Same on the other side. Very, very careful with the soft tissue here. You don't want that saw blade to touch your skin. If it touches the skin, the skin's going to die and you need to debride that. So they've cut those two sides off. Now you can take the datum point out because you've finished all of your tailor cuts. And you then knock off those lateral and medial uh, sides because you've only cut down into them. And you're taking off 11 millimeters on the medial side and 16 millimeters on the lateral side. And that's true of all the sizes. They come as six different sizes. So you're leaving yourself with the tailor that you've prepared at the front and the top and the back and both sides. So you've got a lot of surface area for osseointegration. They're just making sure they get that back part out 
Clearly, you don't want to leave that in. Don't ever leave any bits of bone around these ankle placements. It's a grave mistake to do so. And they're just chamfering the sides again, presumably because they haven't, their cuts aren't quite perfect for them. And again, one of the nice parts about this particular implant now is that it has a trial, a window trial here. So this is exactly the same size and shape as the talus, but it's got bits of it cut out so that you can see through it. Because obviously with the tailor component being a hat, once it's on, you can't see what's underneath. So they tap that into place and make sure that looking through those windows, that implant is sitting down onto bone throughout. And again, fluoroscopy is used to check that it's seated, which it is. And they then fix that in place because this now is a cutting jig for putting in a central keel. So the star has a keel that sits into the middle of the um, talus, which needs preparation with a small router. Again, looks a bit like a drill, but it's a router. Make a series of holes and then link them together and then chisel out the center. You can see it's a stop drill, so you're not going into the subtalar joint here and you can't go into the subtalar joint. It's too short. So they route that out, take out that... Uh, window uh, guide and then use a osteotome or a punch really to just finish off that fin because the fin has got to be a really good fit so again a little bit of fiddling at the front which they seem to like to do remove little bits of bone from there and then this is your fin cutting punch it's sharp on the bottom and it just completes that and it's slightly bigger than the window you've cut so it compresses the bone out without fracturing it and I check this by making sure I can lift the whole leg up on that fin guide. So I would now lift the leg up on that, knowing that it's really, really a really snug fit. It needs to be a snug fit. There you go. That's what it looks like. You see it's serrated edges. They pull it out with a degree of difficulty. And they then put the tailor component in. So there are no, they don't use, tri I have a set of trials that I use, but the set doesn't come with them. So they then, they've sized it. They know what size they're going to put in. You can see they're very careful to make sure that fin goes in the right place. And then the tailor component is introduced, pushing it backward onto that fin, so that the fin is right at the back, before they then push the tailor downward onto the tailor itself. Very heavy use of a hammer here. I use a large five pound hammer and hit it bloody hard. Excuse me, hard. So that tailor component is, uh, is seated well down now. Now you can't check that fluoroscopically because it's got sides like a hat. So you don't know that that's seated down, you can't see that. So now it's time to just prepare the lug holes uh, in the tibia. So you've got to protect the tailor component because that's your real tailor component that you've got in there. So they're just marking up the depth there because you have different sized tibial components in terms of their front to back and their width. They've measured that up. They're checking it on the guide to make sure they've got the correct size. They're not protecting the component there, which they should because that, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't be happy with that, but the, that guide is now introduced. They should have something in there to protect that tibial component against that guide, in my opinion. You don't want to scratch cobalt chrome, do you? Guess this patient's a cadaver. She's not going to complain. So they've now put a trial in to make sure that everything's well aligned. That's a trial meniscal bearing. So they're checking it's got good rotation and that there's a good alignment between the tailor component and the tibial component guide and they then fix that guide in because those two lug holes that you can see there on that x-ray, the big holes, they're about to be drilled. And this is what creates the barrels, which the star is the only replacement that uses this particular barrel design. So they drill two holes here. The star's got very good 14-year survivorship. Um, it's the longest surviving anchor replacement with the, the longest and best survivorship of any. So they put a little temporary... Uh, a plug in there to make sure there's no tilt because these drill holes have got to be perfect. They angle the drill hole very slightly upward so that as the implant goes in and it's running down those two barrels, it's drifted up onto the tibial cut surface. Complete the uh, fin cuts here with a little fin osteotome. Bone's quite soft. They don't even need to use a hammer there. Normally you'd need to tap that. And then you, I would put that lug in the other hole now. They don't. And then they put a, a little uh, fin completion, fin cutting uh, chisel. And again, it's easy because it's a cadaver. Take the meniscal bearing out and take that guide out now. Careful that they haven't scratched that tailor component. I don't like the way they do that. You need to protect that. Looks like it's scratched to me already. 
And then the tibial component is put in on a, a large jig, which makes sure that it's locked on, that you've got complete control as you float those barrels into the holes and, and make sure that this component is well seated. This component is uh, hydroxyapatite coated on the back. It's plasma sprayed and HA coated, which I think is an advantage. This normally you'd need to hammer this in. I think they probably do need to hammer it in. You see how they're angling it up so that the barrels draw the tibial component up onto the cut surface so that it's really well opposed, so that you've got good bony ingrowth. Drift it in with a few gentle taps. Make sure that those barrels then sink and that that tibial component is right at the back. They'll probably use fluoroscopy now, I suspect, to check that it is. It looks nice, it's well aligned. They've got a good joint space. But of course, it's not an arthritic ankle, so this ankle isn't stiff like many of the ones that we do. They all have limited ankle motion when you're doing an ankle replacement. This is a trial bearing. They're just checking the meniscal bearing, make sure that they don't overstuff the joint, which will limit motion, or understuff it, which will leave it unstable. And that's probably a seven, maybe an eight millimeter bearing, which is about the right size you want to be going for. Seven or eight is probably the correct size bearing. And they're just checking that they've got subtalar motion stability, that it's not trying to tilt. If it tilts, it will edge load, and you'll have early implant failure. And then normally, if you're happy with that, they would take out that trial bearing and put in a real meniscal bearing, which is made out of uh, uh, cross-linked high molecular weight, ultra, ultra high molecular weight polyethylene, popped in with your finger, if it doesn't go in with your finger, the joint's too tight. Just check that. You can see the mobile bearing drifting backward and forward, which it does, and it rotates as the ankle joint dorsiflex and plantar flexes, because as Mark said yesterday, the talus is a truncated cone. Its instantaneous rotation, rotational axis moves, which is why you need a mobile bearing ankle. So they've got good motion, a good 10 or 15 degrees of dorsiflexion, and a good 35 degrees of plantar flexion. They seem to keep checking subtalar motion. I'm not quite sure why. I think they're checking to, for tailor tilt. And the radiograph shows that's beautifully seated. That tibial component is perfect. And the alignment is very nice on both the AP and lateral images. Meniscal bearing, you can see little wires in it to show you where it's sitting. Full plantar flexion, and full dorsiflexion. The mobile bearing's stable. It's not trying to come out. They're pretty happy with that. They then graft the little barrel holes, which I think is an important thing to do. The main reason I think that's important is because if you do get any osteolysis, so any poly uh, debris, you don't want the poly debris to find its way into those barrels and make that tibial component loose. So a little bit of bone in there will seal those off from joint fluid, in, in, uh, ingress of joint fluid or poly debris. They then don't take it all apart, of course, because this is uh, only a cadaver and they want to take it out. And they're just trying to show you how you could remove them if you had an intraoperative problem. They've actually got devices specifically made so that you can remove these implants, um, in theory, without damaging the other implants, because you need to be able to take that tailor component, sorry, tibial component out. They lift off the talus. Ordinarily, at this point, clearly, you'd be closing this wound now. I close the capsules often with one or two sutures, but then an absolutely meticulous closure of the retinaculum. That's paramount. If that retinaculum fails, those tendons will saw their way through the wound and you'll have a wound healing problem. So meticulous interrupted closure of the retinaculum and then meticulous skin closure with no tension in it at all. Postoperatively, dressings, I apply a short uh, plaster cast back slab for two weeks and then the patient is fully weight bearing from two weeks in a removable boot allowing early range of motion exercises from two weeks on, fully weight bearing. And they can get rid of that boot as soon as they want to. Usually by about week four, they're mobilizing around the home without the boot on. Normally by week six, they're mobilizing outdoors, often with crutches still. And by the time they get to eight to ten weeks, they're mobilizing without crutches. Very, very much like a knee replacement behaves, really. Is that okay? Has anyone got any questions about that? Questions for the whole session? Okay. So if we can have Mark and Trish and the potential risk of increased heel loading, I don't think it has any major significant biomechanical abnormalities. But you saw Trish's uh, picture. Many patients, even with a plantar grade foot, are still able to squat. So they, because the movement in the midfoot increases, so they're able to accommodate for that. For the Indian population, uh, I think that's a perfectly reasonable thing to do. Can I just uh, make an announcement for people who are leaving and uh, still here as well? Um, if you haven't filled your feedback forms, can you please do that and hand out as you're walking out? Your certificates will be uh, sent out to you. Um, so for those of you who are staying here, 
That's absolutely fine. It's just for the people who are leaving at the back. Any questions? <laughs> any, any more questions at all? Um, I, think, I think you've all realized that the, the, uh, the total ankle replacement operation is a formidable operation. Uh, it's a very elaborate and complex operation. I think we can't overemphasize the need for a, a large amount of education before you embark on it. Uh, I think that, that is definitely the, the biggest take-home message. W would you agree with that, Chris? Like I, I, like I said, I think, um, in, for me, an ankle replacement is the hardest operation I do. And, I, and I'm not a frightened chap. I do quite a few fairly difficult operations, but none, I think, as difficult as an ankle replacement, both in terms of the technical element to it, but also really, really careful counselling of your patient. Your expectation management of that patient is pivotal to whether that ankle replacement is going to be either the right thing to do or if it's going to work. And you have to think about your what you're going to do when it doesn't work. They won't all work. What are you going to do when it doesn't work? When that patient comes back with progressive malalignment or pain, you've got to be a confident surgeon to take that out and to look at really complex revisional procedures. So don't take it on lightly. That's great. So in my series of 84, I've done seven arthrodeses. How many years later? Uh, a mixture. I mean, that's what the Kaplan-Meier survivor curve shows. All of those patients who have failed have had an arthrodesis, uh, bar two who have had a revision ankle replacement. So that, that Kaplan-Meier curve shows, shows the rate of failure. Are there any other questions? Um, okay. I think we have a round of applause for all the faculty who have done an excellent session on ankle arthritis uh, this afternoon. Um, I'll start with thanking delegates, I think, um, but because both days we've had a really good attendance of delegates, a lot of interaction, particularly today, uh, and a lot of good sessions uh, in the last two days. And for me, it's been learning experience throughout the year um, to organize this, and I really enjoyed my uh, last two days and have had the same feeling from all the faculty and delegates when I've been interact interacting with you. So a big round of applause for you guys who really stuck here for two days and participated in foot and ankle learning. A massive thanks to faculty both from the UK and from here um, in organizing and being with me um, throughout the thick, thicks and thins of uh, you know, organization of any course or, uh, or a workshop. And I can't thank them enough um, for, for their contribution, really. So a big thank you to all. <laughs> Thanks to local organizers uh, for allowing us to do this, and also um, both of us for supporting this course. Um, and I think uh, it's a great educational experience uh, for all of us involved here in the last two days. Um, so both organizations really need, it, need some credit for that. Um, thanks to the industry people, um, particularly Synthes for organizing the workshop um, and also Integra and Arthrex to give us some stuff to bring it here and show us you all. So thank you very much. Um, without, are there anything, uh, how do you want to say? So yeah, I'll, I'll just reiterate again, you have to give us feedback. Uh, we're still lacking a few forms. If you haven't done your feedback, please do so. There are still forms outside as well. Uh, your certificates will be emailed to you by local organizers once we've gone through the feedback and everything that you will all get a certificate uh, emailed to you. So we have got your emails through your feedback and they will all be emailed to you. Some of the handouts for the uh, presentations uh, are not printed in time and I apologize for that. It's down to local printing uh, units where they were printing them. So we'll endeavor to get those across to you via local organization again. OK. Well, thank you very much. And uh, safe journeys wherever you're traveling. For those of you who are still in uh, Iocon, have a great time.